calls his company Amazon.com, Earth's biggest bookstore. You can't drop by, not in person anyway. For the customer, Amazon only exists on the computer screen. But Bezos does have an office, so we wangled an invitation. And where's Amazon's headquarters? The public relations people told us to come to 1516 Second Avenue between Pike and Pine in Seattle. But when we pass the pawn shop and the porno parlor, the wig store and the down market teriyaki joint, we didn't see anything that looked vaguely cutting edge. No corporate drives or office towers. Just a heroin needle exchange and an old building called Columbia. But it had the number 1516, so we walked inside. And there it was, the logo known to every web shopper in the world. Upstairs, it doesn't look very high-tech either. More like a college dorm than a corporate headquarters. And then, there's the boss. <laughs> you generally hear him before you see him. <laughs> it's the ear-piercing laugh of billionaire Jeff Bezos. Now, I've heard a lot about your desk. It's a door with mm -hmm. four-by-fours. Come on. <laughs> what? I mean, you, you, you can oh. afford a better desk than that. It's a symbol yeah. of spending money on things that matter to customers and not spending money on things that don't. And you don't need clean carpets. What are these things <laughs> on the floor? <laughs> uh, well, these are, um, these are, you know, sticky balls. They're yeah, obviously they work, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's very impressive. Remember, this man is a titan of our time, a giant. What kind of kid were you? Well, it, it, uh, I was a good student. I always worked really hard. I was nerdy. You were nerdy. <laughs> I was nerdy. <laughs> that hasn't changed, by the way. <laughs> did, did you realize it back then? My watch updates itself from the atomic clock 36 times a day, if that gives you any indication. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid so. But you did really well, huh? In school? Yeah. yeah, I was always a good student. Bezos went to a Montessori school when he was three. By third grade, teachers knew he was gifted. A year later, he started playing with computers. In high school, he was valedictorian of his graduating class. Socially? Socially, uh, I was a little awkward, I think would be. <laughs> what way to put it? Blind dates? Uh, not until, I didn't really date much until like my last year of college. Which was where? which was at Princeton. Uh -huh. Actually, I set up sort of a formal plan to date. I had all my friends set me up on blind dates. None of them worked out very well. Maybe it was his intensity, or maybe it was the way he talks. Listen to the way he describes his company's business plan. We believe that this is a critical category formation time. Bezos uses the same kind of Wall Street wonk talk when he talks or thinks about almost anything, including what he wants out of life. The way I made the decision to leave Wall Street and do this was, you know, it'll sound geeky to you, but um, it was a regret minimization framework. So this is how I actually made That's the decision. Sort of, if I understand it, if I can translate that into English I can deal with, does that mean um, I want to live my life so that in a few decades from now I'm not going to regret it? That's exactly right. Uh, I want to have lived my life in such a way that when I'm 80 years old, I've minimized the number of regrets that I have. I think actually a lot of people do that. I think they, even if they don't you know, call it something as dorky as regret minimization framework, they, they behave that way anyway. They think that way. And but for you it was not carpe diem. It was not wine, women, and song. No, 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 no. I, the, I don't go in for carpe diem. I go in for regret minimization framework. <laughs> Absolutely. When Bezos left that Wall Street job in 1994, he followed that old American edict go west, young man. He and his wife didn't know where they were going. In fact, the movers packed their things and were already on the road when Bezos phoned them to say he had decided on Seattle. His other big decision? Books. Sell books. 
not in stores, but over the internet. The company took off like a rocket. Did you read the Times this morning, New York Times? Yeah, I saw, I saw the Times this morning. At one point on Friday, Amazon.com's total stock market value surged past $30 billion, making it worth more than a major industrial company like Texaco. That didn't blow your mind when you read it? Well, I think if you're asking for sort of an emotional response, I think it's, it's, it's very humbling and it creates a sense of responsibility. According to my calculations, you yourself are worth somewhere in the vicinity of nine or ten billion dollars today. I only say that because I've got a follow-up question. Okay. What's with the Honda? <laughs> this is a perfectly good car. <laughs> in July of 1995, from this modest ranch house outside Seattle, Bezos sold his first book. Today, he has five huge warehouses in the United States and Europe, packed not only with books, but with CDs and movies. Last year, Amazon sold more than $600 million worth of merchandise over the Internet. Hey, PK, uh, local financial, I think that's you. C-93 is coming back. And the stock? If you'd bought $1,000 worth of Amazon stock in 1997, it would be worth between thirty dollars and $60,000 today. Bruce Smith is an analyst for Jefferies & Company in New York. Is this investing or is it gambling? Uh, right now with the frenzy we've had, to me it feels much more like gambling. Because it's crazy. Well, I don't, I don't find it rational, to be honest with you. It went up almost a thousand percent last year. When have you seen anything comparable? Nothing. But there are huge risks. The internet is real. Real money is being spent. It's not going to stop. But what you could have is a decline in these stocks of 50, 75 percent. But investors keep flooding in. Why? Amazon snagged almost two million new customers at the end of last year. And like other internet companies, it's growing much faster than those old blue chips. Example, internet giant Yahoo is worth more on paper than the total value of Kmart, Hilton Hotels, and Delta Airlines combined. <laughs> Call it the revenge of the nerds, the computer nerds. And the fastest moving titles are over here. Well, here's Stephen King, there's Daniel Steele, sexual McCarthyism. There you go. Title of the day. <laughs> <laughs> There's no dress code and no hair color code in a place the customer will never see, the Amazon warehouse. Computers do everything here. Australia. Japan. Japan. California. Customers generally get their books very quickly, but... You can't do this, you know, you can't... You can't, you can't touch the book. You can't hear the binding creak. Yeah. You can't smell the paper. Mm, and it's a great smell. And it is. And, and, I, and, and that's why it's a very different experience. With his computers, Bezos used to sell a lot of computer books to computer nerds. These days, the Amazon goes everywhere. In the last hour, the best-selling book at Amazon.com has been The Greatest Generation by Tom Brokaw. You think we're going to put that on television? <laughs> I don't know. It'll be a test of your credibility. <laughs> <laughs> a while ago, I bought a few books from Amazon. This time, after I logged on, the computer greeted me back, welcoming me by name. Is this you? That's, That's me. you. That's me. Okay. Uh -huh. The computer also remembered my past orders, and after comparing me with other customers who'd bought the same books, it calculated which new books I might like to buy. The Untouchable, The Comfort of Strangers, Death in Summer, Breakfast on Pluto, I Married a Communist. That's awfully good. I mean, frankly, so it's very good because I've already bought two of those books in bookstores. That's because people who have your same mm -hmm. sort of buying profile, that electronic soulmate, This is really scary. I've read a lot of these books and bought many of the others. And using the same kind of computer wizardry, Amazon also had some ideas about what kind of music I might like to buy. Elvis Costello, Dylan, Bob Dylan, Dylan Van Dylan. Morrison. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you can listen to these. <laughs> I didn't so know you that. can listen to samples. Now, every time I use your website, you learn more about me. Yes. One of your employees has said that you collect half a gigabyte, whatever that is, of information on your customers every day. That's about 350 floppy disks worth. Mm. What do you do with that information? 
That's the data that allows us to predict or try to predict what, you know, uh, what books and videos and music that you would like that you don't that you haven't discovered yet. All of that data, information about the likes and dislikes of millions of customers is stored here on well-guarded, ultra-secret, dust-free, and very expensive computers. Bezos refuses to rule out selling the valuable information to other companies in the future, but he doesn't think his customers are concerned about the issue. And Wall Street isn't concerned that Amazon has never made a profit, not a dime. In fact, it lost $125 million last year. The company says it's investing for the future. Skeptics say it would have to sell every book being sold in the world today to justify its stock price. I think my generation grew up with Sears. And Amazon is worth 20% more than Sears is worth in market capitalization. How do you view that phenomenon that Amazon today is worth more than Sears? Investors are focused on the future. Amazon has growth potential that Sears doesn't. A couple of geeks who sketched out some software could destroy Sears Roebuck. That's the beauty of technology and the microprocessor. We've never seen anything like it. But history has seen revolutions before, one thing supplanting another. Could Amazon and its tributaries be flowing towards the shopping mall and eventually drown it out? If you were running Walmart today, would you feel threatened by Amazon? Absolutely. Would you decide to go after them? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, they already are. Walmart is suing Amazon for hiring away some of its top executives. As for Barnes & Noble, its stock is worth much less than Amazon's, but in a down-and-dirty negative ad campaign, Barnes & Noble is reminding readers it has many more books to offer than Amazon. It's getting really nasty out there, it seems to me. The online bookstore, the Barnes & Noble bookstore, is so big it makes Amazon.com look tiny. It seems to me that this is almost a declaration of war. Well, it's not just Barnes & Noble. But one of the Walmart things... is suing you? That's right. And You're surrounded by enemies. People want to get you. The establishment is big and powerful. Do you ever get scared? Well, I, I tell people around here to wake up petrified and afraid every morning. Do you? I do. It is not uncommon for people who have achieved the kind of startling success you have in such a short period of time develop a pretty strong fear about losing it all. Are you afraid of that? I know we can lose it all. It's not a fear. <laughs> it's a fact. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. When you meet Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, you're immediately struck by two things. <laughs> that legendary laugh and his nearly unmatched focus on customer service. We know customers like low prices. We know customers like big selection. And we know that customers like fast delivery. And those things are going to be true 10 years from now. They're going to be true 20 years from now. So we can count on those things and we can put energy into them. He met with us at Amazon Seattle headquarters to personally show off the company's new line of souped up lightweight Kindle Fire tablets. One of them is priced at only $139. Apple's cheapest iPad is nearly $200 more. One of the things you've done so well at Amazon is you've undercut all of your rivals by keeping the prices low. Does that same strategy apply to tablets? Yes, our approach is premium products at non-premium prices. So we sell the hardware at break even. So we don't try to make any money when we sell this hardware. And we hope to make money when people use the devices, not when they buy the devices. And so that's a very different approach from uh, most companies. Most companies are building quite a bit of profit into the sale of these devices. The approach this time also includes a feature never seen before on any kind of device. It's called Mayday, 24-7 tech support. Thanks for using Amazon Assist. I see you hit the Mayday button. I'm your tech advisor, James. How can I help you today? And you can tap the Mayday button. It's just in your right at the top of the menuing system. And a tech uh, support advisor will appear on your screen and can draw on your screen and guide you through things and teach you how to do things. I remember when Steve Jobs introduced the iPad, one thing he said is, we're going to stand on their shoulders and go a bit further. He was talking about the Kindle, um, because we had launched the Kindle, the dedicated reader. Uh, today, the latest generation of that is called Kindle Paperwhite. 
And that's what Steve was talking about. But my question now is, are you, have you taken it up another notch? <laughs> and are you standing on <laughs> Apple's shoulders? I, I don't know. The way I would think about this is that um, there's room for a lot of companies to do well in this arena. This, you know, these tablets, mobile devices, very big market arena. Um, room for companies pursuing different strategies, different product features, all you know, for there to be multiple winners. But in the smartphone arena, that may not be the case, as we've seen with BlackBerry. How do they stumble so badly? You know, I don't know. It's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very reasonable question, and uh, I'm sure it will be, you know, there'll probably be many, many case studies on the history of that company. In many ways, it's uh, still a very innovative company. My guess is there aren't any easy answers to the question you just posed. But what about the questions about Bezos and his latest move, his $250 million purchase of the Washington Post? These are among his first public comments on the acquisition. Why did you get into the newspaper business? For me, um, I thought the Washington Post is an important institution, um, and I uh, am optimistic about its future. It's a personal investment, I'm, uh, and I'm hopeful that I can help from a distance, uh, in part by providing runway for them to do a series of experiments, and uh, in part through bringing the, some of the philosophy that we have used at Amazon uh, uh, to the post. That philosophy, he says, comes down to this. What has worked at Amazon is focusing on the customer, being very uh, putting the customer first, which is easy to say, but difficult to do. If you really are customer centric, it's like being the host of a party. You're holding the party for your guests. Uh, sometimes the host of the party is holding the party for the host of the party. <laughs> and that's, that leads to a different kind of party. For Amazon, the party couldn't be much better now as its stock recently hit an all time high. And the company is poised to become even more relevant in people's lives as it works to expand its popular same day delivery throughout the country. Our view on this is we know customers like their products fast, and so we work on things that we know customers like, and that's not going to change. Dan Simon, CNN, Seattle. Rough week for all cryptocurrencies and Ripple. How do you follow all the, the back and forth? I mean, is it like a roller coaster for you? Are you checking your phone every five seconds? I mean, sort of talk to me about your heart rate. <laughs> You know, it's funny, my, my heart rate definitely uh, does move. That said, I try not to check it more than about once a day. Mm -hmm. And the reason, and the same thing I say internally, I would say here, is you know, I don't think about this success over a three week or three month period. I think about it over a three year or five year period. And at the core, I think all this comes down to, are we solving real problems for real customers? And the, the crypto market overall, if a digital asset's solving a problem, then it's going to drive some value. There's a lot of action in this market, though. It's not clear what value it's really providing. What are the problems you think Ripple is solving? Well, so Ripple is solving a problem for cross-border payments. Mm -hmm. Today, as you may have experienced personally, when you're moving money from you know, here in San Francisco to Paris, it literally is faster to go buy an airplane ticket and fly it there than it is to use the correspondent banking system. That's crazy that we live in a world of, yeah. you know, instant information from Bloomberg or anywhere or anytime, mm -hmm. I can't move my own money from point A to point B efficiently. So Ripple's solving the problem to allow, enable real-time settlement between financial institutions. So do you think there'll be a bounce back? Well, I think we've already seen uh, the markets bounce back some. You know, they, they, I don't follow it day to day, but you know, the, the peak of the market, probably mid-January, the total asset class was about over $800 billion. It dropped down to maybe 300 billion, and I think today it's back to you know 450 or so. Now that's a ton of volatility. My counsel for anyone following these markets is don't follow it day to day. You, you if you believe this is fundamentally a movement that's changing the nature of a, a new asset class, then I think you should measure that over months and years, not day to day. I was in 2001 or two on a plane riding out to one of these conferences that occasionally I go to and I said uh, will Amazon make it and this very smart but not quite too smart investment banker said to me who was the CEO of a firm said no they won't make it you made it <laughs> was there a moment you thought I might not make it the riskiest moment for Amazon Charlie was uh, at the very, very beginning, I needed to raise a million dollars at a certain point. 
and I uh, ended up giving away 20% of the company for a million dollars. A hell of a deal for somebody. A lot of people did very well on that deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, they, but they also took a risk, so they deserved to do very well on that deal. But I, um, I had to take 60 meetings to raise a million dollars, and I raised it from 22 people at approximately $50,000 a person. And it was nip and tuck whether I was going to be able to raise that money. So the whole thing could have ended before it even started. That was 1995, you know, and the first question every investor asked me was, what's the internet? The technology likely to have the greatest impact on the next few decades has arrived. And it's not social media, it's not big data, it's not robotics, it's not even AI. And you'll be surprised to learn that it's the underlying technology of digital currencies like Bitcoin. It's called the blockchain. Block chain. Now, it's not the most sonorous word in the world, but I believe that this is now the next generation of the Internet and that it holds vast promise for every business, every society, and for all of you individually. You know, for the past few decades, we've had the Internet of Information. And when I send you an email or a PowerPoint file or something, I'm actually not sending you the original, I'm sending you a copy. And that's great. This is democratized information. But when it comes to assets, things like uh, money, financial assets like stocks and bonds, loyalty points, intellectual property, music, art, a vote, carbon credit and other assets, sending you a copy is a really bad idea. If I send you $100, it's really important that I don't still have money <laughs> and that I can't send it to you. So this has been called the double spend problem by cryptographers for a long time. So today, we rely entirely on big intermediaries, middlemen like banks, government, big social media companies, credit card companies, and so on, to establish trust in our economy. And these intermediaries perform all the business and transaction logic of every kind of commerce, from authentication, identification of people, through to uh, uh, clearing, settling, and record-keeping. And overall, they do a pretty good job, but there are growing problems. To begin, they're centralized. That means that they can be hacked, and increasingly are. And J.P. Morgan, the U.S. federal government, LinkedIn, Home Depot, and others found that out the hard way. They exclude billions of people from the global economy. For example, people who don't have enough money to have a bank account. They slow things down. It can take a second for an email to go around the world, but it can take days or weeks for money to move through the banking system across the city. And they take a big piece of the action, 10 to 20 percent, just to send money to another country. They capture our data, and that means that we can't monetize it or use it to better manage our lives. And our privacy is being undermined. And the biggest problem is that overall, they've appropriated the largesse of the digital age asymmetrically. And we have wealth creation, but we have growing social inequality. So what if there were not only an internet of information, what if there were an internet of value? Some kind of vast, global, distributed ledger running on millions of computers and available to everybody, and where every kind of asset, from money to music, could be stored, moved, transacted, exchanged, and managed, all without powerful intermediaries. What is up, good people? Jungle Link here, and I just got home from work. And during the day, people were sending me this video. It's a video of David Schwartz giving a presentation it's titled, Building the Internet of Value. And I've heard Brad Garlinghouse give the explanation a million times. And I find David pretty interesting, so I figured I might as well watch it, even though I wasn't sure I was really going to care about the actual content. 
I have to tell you, this may be the most important Ripple video ever made. I am so impressed. First of all, David looks like a mad scientist, but he speaks like a CEO. And he was able to clearly and concisely explain the Ripple transfer system and XRP and how it works into that system and what value it provides. And he even gave an explanation of XVIA, as amazing as that sounds. I actually understand what XVIA does now. But not only does he explain it, he does it in a way that's, that's relatable to a regular everyday person. You know, we hear about moving trillions of dollars around the globe. That's always the focus. And while we can understand that, it can be tough to relate to that specific problem. And he's talking about credit cards, you know, and how, you know, if someone comes to Jungle Link and I give them a $2,000 service and they swipe their credit card and I give them a receipt and I say, thank you for your payment. I haven't actually got paid yet that that payment hasn't settled. There's no money in my bank to go pop bottles and make it rain. I don't have anything. And even a user of their card can understand. You see all these pending transactions, like you use your debit card. No money's really out of your bank account yet. Maybe it's on hold, it's pending, but it takes a day or two sometimes to settle. People can understand that. And he's talking about the tech, you know, in a clear way that we can all understand and how the XRP ledger works and validates transactions and things of this nature. And I'm sitting here watching this video, riveted, stuck to the video. And not once does he talk about how XRP is going to go to $10,000 or $500 or whatever. He doesn't mention that. He's talking about the important things, the things we should be following and focusing on at this point. So I really encourage you to watch this video. Even if you feel you know everything there is to know about XRP, at least watch it so you get an idea of the, the mind-blowing talent that must be within the Ripple building. You know, this is a guy that's supposed to be all about the tech. You know, understand cryptocurrencies and how they work from a tech perspective. But you can tell he understands business. He can get up and speak to the public in a really amazing and clear way. And that just tells you right there, across the board, Ripple has an amazing team, and David Schwartz specifically is an amazing person. I think you'll get a lot from this video. As always, please like, please subscribe, and please watch this David Schwartz video. The revolution will be televised right here on Jungle Link. I'm David Schwartz. I'm the chief cryptographer at Ripple. Um, presentation is on enabling the internet of value, by which we mean being able to move value as easily as we move information. So what is this blockchain thing that we're all so excited about? Well, it's a new technology that presented itself as Bitcoin. And I think we see an analogy with the first uh, developments of other technologies, where there was just some product that embodied that technology. But as the technology matured, we got different designs aimed at different use cases. We have, um, in the analogy, we have a vehicle for moving heavy objects. We have a vehicle that's more of like a sports car and so on. So it, the, des the design focused on the use case rather than just one design that fits every use case. Right now, we have something like 1,500 blockchain-based tokens. And they're fighting over what use cases they're focused on, whether it's payments, trade finance whatever use case. And we looked at a number of use cases for blockchains, including things like securities trading, lending, smart contracts, insurance, and a, and a long list of them. And one of the things that we discovered is that all of those use cases come back to payments. If you're borrowing money, someone's going to pay you that money after you borrowed it. If it's trade finance, there's going to be a movement of money. If there's a smart contract, very often that smart contract is controlling the movement of money. So in all of those cases, there's a value transfer. Ripple has become focused on that value transfer that we need for those other use cases. Uh, we've assembled uh, a team of over 220 full-time employees. We're headquartered in San Francisco. Um, and I would just like to call out our C++ team. We have over 14 C++ developers that are focused on the XRP ledger. XRP is our digital asset. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. 
our vision is to build that internet of value, which is a world in which money can move as easily as information moves. Um, if any of you, I'm sure you've all visited a website or sent an email or in some sense moved information over the internet, and, and I think the thing that you'll most notice is that it is absolutely seamless. It doesn't matter if you're using Wi-Fi, if you're using Ethernet, cable. It, the technology that you're using to access the internet doesn't matter, and it doesn't matter where the website is or where the email is going. It works absolutely painlessly. And in the movement of money, it is the exact opposite. Anytime we're trying to transfer value, we have to be very, very concerned about where that value is going, what systems we're on, and what systems that value is going to. What we'd like to do is change that so that you can make a payment or move money as easily as information moves. I think it's very likely uh, that we will see more collaboration between the Gaffermeers and banks. This research introduces the concept of Gaffermeer. This is the Googles, Amazons, Facebooks of this world, Microsoft, IBM, Alibaba, and so on. They master the data gathering. They ma master the data analysis. They master the cognitive sciences. They master artificial intelligence. These companies are really presenting a huge challenge to the trade finance space because they're big, they're highly liquid, and they speak directly to the clients and the consumers of this world. For banks, that's something very interesting. And the challenge is to work with these organisations for the simple reason that they're working in an unregulated space at the moment. They have the network to supply out to some of the areas that banks at the moment, because of the compliance environment, are finding it quite hard to reach. GAFAMIA will impact banking globally. Now the question is, will they impact by substituting themselves to the existing actors? Or will they impact to provide more accurate tools to this company which will continue to, 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 to own the risk on the financing? This is another question where I'm unable to answer today. I think it's fair to say that the way in which banks are approaching fintech and the way they're beginning to approach new collaborators like the Gaffermeer is to say these are organisations that help us integrate systems. They help us enable better services to clients, they help us reach markets that we might otherwise not be able to reach. So Gaffermeers are incredibly important for banks as, as collaboration partners actually rather than as competitors. So trend number one, Amazon the bank. JP Morgan, 60 million households. Amazon Prime has 66 million Prime members, right? And so when you think about this, um, obviously it's Amazon's on a tear. Just the rumor of them entering a space will send your stock price down, right? So three to four weeks ago, there was a rumor that they're getting into drugstores and pharma, and you know, uh, pharma and you know, Walgreens and the like all kind of cratered. Um, obviously, when they bought Whole Foods, that did not did not do a lot of uh, good for all of their uh, their competitors. You know, they're sort of the everything store in the truest sense of the word, right? So they are in everything now, right? It's you know, AWS is a beast, and obviously, you know, their e-commerce kind of engine is obviously big as well. Um, you know, could it be its next target? You know, when you look at Amazon from a customer satisfaction perspective, right? They do better than most of the, you know, all of the sort of incumbent financial services institutions. When you talk to millennials especially, like a lot of them will tell you that they, you know, surveys will say they pr would prefer uh, to, you know, bank or do financial services with Google, Amazon, Facebook, right? So you have this opportunity here, you know, Alex from Andreessen Horowitz kind of talking about uh, if they can start lending you lending you money and extending you credit, it just feeds the the sort of uh, buying machine that they've built. You know, the chatter about Amazon and banking or financial services is obviously increasing. Um, you know, these are some of the areas that Amazon is already in. You know, great payments traction. 
we think IP is a really interesting area when you look at Amazon, right? So um, they're working on facial identity and selfies as a means of payment, right? So um, IP is a great leading indicator for what Amazon's working on. When you actually looked at, just to kind of play back the Whole Foods acquisition, right? You looked at their logistics patents, logistics warehousing over time. You actually saw a lot more activity from Amazon on the patent side, which kind of, you know, it's hard to predict an a acquisition like Whole Foods, but you knew they were gonna make some moves here. Um, you know, they've been extending credit to small businesses, um, you know, uh, cash, you know, again, like their ambition is sort of unmatched in terms of what they're trying to do. And then they play the long game, right? So we look back in the patent database that we have. This is a patent from 2004, right? So they've been thinking about, you know, fin services, either how it reduces um, friction in their own purchasing process or how to own more of that, uh, of that sort of value chain over time. Um, you know, they're gonna go after different segments. I think this is really sort of one of the things that they do. So how will they and when will they take on more of the bank? So I think one of the first N plus one trends we think it's worth looking at and obviously who would be affected, it's probably everybody in this room. So, um Another one. Uh, the investment firm Bain says Amazon could become the third biggest bank if it wants to. It says Amazon's banking services could grow to more than 70 million consumer relationships in the next five years. It would therefore rival like Wells Fargo. Yeah, I, you I'm, don't see it. I, I'm no. not buying it. I mean, uh, this is all on the news that Amazon is said to be in talks to open, to work on a checking account offer from J.P. Morgan Chase. Amazon has not even made a formal announcement about that. For, to, the, for that number to be reached, to be a Wells Fargo type, type bank, it would have to sign up set more than 75% of their existing prime members into checking. I, I just don't see it. I agree <laughs> with Lizzie. <laughs> you agree no, it's absolute rubbish. Do you know how hard what? it is to change your bank account when you have all your standing orders, all your prearranged, you know, payments made? It's an absolute nightmare to undo everything and then take your account somewhere else. Forget That's it. That's a good point. I see it as an yeah. employee. Remember, Amazon pays about a quarter of a billion dollars a year in interchange fees for credit card use. Now, this threat can be used in order to push that down. And they also have to be careful what they wish for. GE Finance was in banking. Wells Fargo has some troubles here. It's not an easy business. It's I overregulated. Don't, right? I don't see it's the really high-end customers wanting to talk with Alexa about their next it, mortgage. Online okay, banking, hold on, hold on. Online Scott with the banker never, went up, never took off. Almost yeah. out of time, but Scott Martin, last word to you. Will Amazon successfully get into the banking business, retail banking? I, I, I sure hope they don't, sir, because we own the stock and we own it for the retail side, not for the banking stuff that they're hoping to do, maybe. Well, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Stick with their knitting. Ten Stick seconds, just like that. Real tight little soundbite <laughs> yeah. from Scott Martin. It's great to be back. Oh, it really is. Welcome back. Uh, for, uh, for allowing me to come up on stage and share uh, our story, uh, Ripple's story, about building the Internet of Value. Uh, I'm Ashish Birla. I'm the Senior Vice President of Ripple. I've been building blockchain solutions for Ripple for five years. Feels like 100 years in blockchain, uh, but I'm still standing here, and uh, I'm excited to tell you a little bit how, about our path uh, to get uh, where we are today. Uh, so, you know, this has been a long journey for, for us in the blockchain space. Uh, I call the early days that flat line. If you told people you worked in blockchain, they thought you were crazy. And uh, it's been you know, $1.5 billion in market cap in 2013, only a few digital currencies and assets out there, to today where you have $438 billion of market cap and thousands and thousands of digital currencies out there. And it's sort of like, how do you make sense of some of this madness that's out there? And uh, is it really $438 billion of value created out there? Well, a couple of things to think about. Uh, number one is product market fit. Are you using blockchain to solve a specific problem, or are you just using blockchain to fundraise or because it's the, the latest buzzword? So that's number one. Number two, even if you're solving a problem, is that problem big enough for your customers to care? 
And what we've found is that, listen, if that problem is not 10x better by your blockchain solutions, they don't care. It's not worth the change and the hassle to go through and implement your new fancy blockchain solution. And the third, because we are here talking about payments, you can't talk about payments without, without talking about regulation. And so what's your regulatory strategy? Are you engaging in safe, compliant ways to move money, especially in Ripple's case where it's cross-border? And so I think that's the third one. And so how do you separate the signal from the noise? I mean, there is a company uh, that has a iced tea on the blockchain. And I promise you that iced tea does not taste any better now that it's on the blockchain. But their stock rose 30% because they said they're going to be on the blockchain. So I think that the, the main thing is, I mean, are you solving customer problems? Are you gaining traction? And do you have product market fit? And you know, that's what we've been about uh, from, from day one. But it wasn't easy for us to get there. Uh, early on, we tried a whole bunch of things on, on the blockchain in 2013, a lot of them horrible ideas. But we took a page from Jeff Bezos and Amazon and really boiled it down to what is Ripple going to be good at? And we really picked cross-border payments. And we focused and focused and focused on cross-border payments. And partially because almost every other use case you build upon that's innovative on the blockchain starts with innovating on payments itself. For example, smart contracts. People, contracts have been around for a long time. People put it on a blockchain. They called it a smart contract. That's the only thing that's different. What's novel about it is that you can have people run your application around the world without knowing them, without trusting them, because you can pay for it using a digital asset. And that's, that's the innovation. So it comes back to payments as the baseline use case for a lot of other things that will come on the blockchain. But if you don't solve payments first, you can't innovate on top of it. And so there are a lot of problems that you have to solve. And we talked to a lot of our customers uh, around the world. And, and I was surprised that even large customers, it takes them three to five days to get the payment where it needs to be. And uh, you know, this was the case of uh, Amazon. Um, paying merchants cross-border and taking weeks for that payment to arrive. 5% And so there are a lot of problems that you have to solve. And we talked to a lot of our customers. Uh, around the world, and, and I was surprised that even large customers, it takes them three to five days to get the payment where it needs to be. And uh, you know, this was the case of uh, Amazon uh, paying merchants cross-border and taking weeks for that payment to arrive. <clears throat> 5% Hello, my name is Jeff Bezos. Uh, I started Amazon.com about 15 years ago. Uh, tons of stories from the early days. So we started the company in my house. Um, we didn't have enough electric power in the house at a certain point. We only had about four employees at the, uh, then, but we already had enough computers and computer servers that we had to string these big orange electric extension cords from every room in the house to get enough power uh, into the room where the office was. So we were basically, all the circuit breakers were flipping. We couldn't plug a vacuum cleaner in anywhere without flipping all the circuit breakers. So we finally had to move to a real office. When we uh, launched the store, um, we ha made a, a very early mistake. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, software bugs of all time. We found that uh, customers could order a negative quantity of books and we would credit their credit card with the price and I assume wait around for them to ship us the books. Um, <laughs> we, we, we fixed that one. Uh, it's fixed. And uh, we've, we've made a bunch of other mistakes over time, but we've learned a lot. My whole body is covered in scar tissue. We initially programmed a bell to ring every time we got an order. And I'm very pleased to say that within the first 30 days of doing business, that bell got annoying. Uh, so we had to turn it off. There was a great moment when we were examining every order that would come into Amazon and it was always a family member placing the order. And the first order that we got from a stranger, I remember, you know, there were probably uh, half a dozen or ten of us in the company at that time were all gathered around after the bell rang and looking at the order. And we're like, 
is that your mom? That's not my mom. Um, and, and, and thus it began. A lot has happened over the last 15 years. As I said, we've made a lot of mistakes. We've learned some things. Uh, and I want to tell you uh, everything I know. I can guarantee you everything I know, it's a very short list. The, this won't take long. Um, and it pretty, it's, it's complete, too. Um, all right, well, the first thing I know is that you need to obsess over customers. Uh, I can tell you that we have been doing this from the very beginning, and it's the only reason that Amazon.com exists today in any form. Uh, we've always put customers first. When given the choice of obsessing over competitors or obsessing over customers, we always obsess over customers. We pay attention to what our competitors do, but it's not where we put our energy. It's not where we get our motivation from. We really like to uh, uh, start with customers and work backwards. And again, that is the key thing uh, that I know, and it covers a lot of other mistakes. If you're truly obsessed over customers, it'll cover a lot of errors. Um, the second thing I know is invent. It's really important to invent. Uh, anytime we have a problem, we never accept either or thinking. Uh, we try to figure out a solution that gets both things. And that often requires invention, but you can invent your way out of any box if you believe that you can. And what we talk about is inventing on behalf of customers. Uh, it's not a customer's job to invent on, on, for themselves. Uh, you need to listen to customers. It's critical. Uh, if you don't listen to customers, you'll go astray. But they won't tell you everything, and so you need to invent on their behalf. And that focus on invention has uh, served us well. Some of the recent things, uh, even uh, Kindle, uh, not just Kindle, but EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud, these are things that we would have never gotten to if we didn't have an inventive culture. But it also, those are kind of large grain things, but they're small things too. And then, think long term. Uh, this is really uh, critical. Any company that wants to focus on customers and put customers first, any company that wants to invent on behalf of customers has to be willing to think long term. And it's actually much rarer than you might think. I find that most of the uh, initiatives we undertake may take five to seven years um, before they pay any dividends for the company. Uh, they may start paying dividends for customers right away, but they often take a long time to pan out for shareholders and the company. So that ability to think in sort of five years and seven year time frames really is very, very useful uh, for us and, I, and it's definitely one of the things that I know. It requires, by the way, uh, and allows a willingness to be misunderstood. If you think long term, many, many of the inventions that we undertake, maybe if they're disruptive in any way, they may not be understood in, in the early innings and it's always been very important for us to think long term so that we can tolerate being misunderstood. We've been called Amazon.toast, Amazon.con, um, uh, many different things, uh, many of them not uh, appropriate for uh, a, a video. Um, <laughs> and we, if, if, we, if we think we're right, um, then we continue. If we think we're wrong, if we're criticized about something we think we're wrong, we change it, um, we fix it. Um, so uh, it's important to really think about those things, but never to uh, buckle to sort of uh, kind of uh, standard kinds of pressures that come on that really force short-term thinking. And it's a huge competitive advantage to be able to think long term, and you get to serve customers much better. All right. Um, that's all that I know, really. I, I know one more thing. I'll save it for the end. Um, but I, I want to, you know, this is a very exciting day. Um, Zappos is a company that I have long admired, uh, and for a very uh, important reason. You know, Zappos has a customer obsession. Um, which is so easy for me to admire. It is the starting point for Zappos. It is the place where Zappos begins and ends. And that is a very key factor for me. And I'm kind of, you know, I get all weak need when I see a customer obsessed company. Um, and Zappos certainly is that. Uh, Zappos also has a totally unique culture. It's unique. I've seen a lot of companies, and I have never seen a company with a culture like Zappos's. And I think that that kind of unique culture is a very significant asset uh, and I'm super excited about that. You know, I've spent a lot of time talking with 
Fred and Alfred and Tony, and uh, I have a good feeling for how important that culture is uh, to Zappos, the Zappos brand, the Zappos customers, the Zappos employees. And that culture and the Zappos brand are huge assets that I value very much, and I want to see those things continue. Um, and you're in such great hands with uh, Fred, Alfred, and Tony. That's a really, that's a really big deal. Um, I've seen a lot of leaders of companies too, and I haven't seen people better than those three. There's a lot of growth ahead of us with Zappos. This really is the beginning. Um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm just totally excited about what can be accomplished over time. Uh, it, it, my, my belief is we haven't seen anything yet. As much as Zappos has accomplished already, and it's a lot, with that unique culture and that great Zappos brand and those terrific leaders, I know that it's just the very beginning. And that brings me to my final thing that I know. It's always day one. There's always more invention in the future, always more customer innovation, new ways to obsess over customers. Thank you. What if there were a native medium for value? Well, in 2008, the financial industry crashed, and perhaps propitiously, a unknown uh, or anonymous person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto created a paper where he developed a protocol for a, a digital cash that used an underlying cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. And this cryptocurrency enabled people to establish trust and do transactions without a third party. And the seemingly simple act set off a spark that's uh, ignited the world, that has everyone excited or terrified or otherwise interested in many places. Now, don't be confused about Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin is an asset. It goes up and down. And that should be of interest to you if you're a speculator. More broadly, it's a cryptocurrency. It's not a fiat currency controlled by a nation state. And that's of greater interest. But the real pony here is the underlying technology. It's called blockchain. So for the first time now in human history, people everywhere can trust each other and transact peer to peer. And trust is established not by some big institution, but by collaboration, by cryptography, and by some clever code. And because trust is native to the technology, I call this the trust protocol. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how does this thing work? Fair enough. Assets, digital assets like money to music and everything in between, are not stored in a central place, but they're distributed across a global ledger using the highest level of cryptography. And when a transaction is conducted, it's posted globally across millions and millions of computers. And out there around the world is a group of people called miners. These are not young people, they're Bitcoin miners. And they have massive computing power at their fingertips, 10 to 100 times bigger than all of Google worldwide. And these miners do a lot of work. And every 10 minutes, kind of like the heartbeat of a network, a block gets created that has all the transactions from the previous 10 minutes. And then the miners get to work trying to solve some uh, tough problems, and they compete. And the first miner to find out the truth and to validate the block is rewarded in digital currency, in the case of the Bitcoin blockchain, with Bitcoin. And then, this is the key part, that block is linked to the previous block and the previous block to create a chain of blocks. And everyone is timestamped, kind of like with a digital wax seal. So if I wanted to go and, and hack a block and say, pay you uh, and you with the same money, I'd have to hack that block, plus all the preceding blocks, the entire history of commerce on that blockchain, not just on one computer, but across millions of computers simultaneously, all using the highest levels of encryption in the light of the most powerful computing resource in the world that's watching me, tough to do. And this is infinitely more secure than the computer systems that we have today. Blockchain, that's 
how it works. So the Bitcoin blockchain is just one. There are many. The Ethereum blockchain was developed by a Canadian named Vitalik Buterin.、Uh, he's 19 years old, and、uh, and this blockchain has some extraordinary capabilities. One of them is that you can build smart contracts. It's kind of what it sounds like. It's a contract that self-executes, and the contract. Handles the enforcement and the management, performance and payment. The contract kind of has a bank account too, in a sense, of agreements between people. And today, on the Ethereum blockchain, there are projects underway to do everything from create a new replacement for the stock market to create a new model of democracy where where politicians are accountable to citizens. So to understand. What a radical change this is going to bring! Let's look at one industry: financial services. You recognize this? Rube Goldberg machine. It's a ridiculously complicated machine that does something really simple, like crack an egg or shut a door. Well, kind of reminds me of the financial services industry, honestly. I mean, you tap your card in the in the corner store, and a bit stream goes through a dozen companies. And、uh, each with their own computer system. Some of them being 1970s mainframes, older than many of the people in this room. And three days later, a settlement occurs. Well, with a blockchain financial industry, there would be no settlement because the payment and the settlement is the same activity. It's just a change in the ledger. So Wall Street and all around the world, the financial industry is in a big. Upheaval about this, wondering can we be replaced, or how do we embrace this technology for success? Now, why should you care? Well, let me describe some applications. Prosperity. The first era of the internet, the Internet of Information, brought us wealth, but not shared prosperity because social inequality is growing, and this is at the heart. Of all of the anger and extremism and protectionism and xenophobia and worse that we're seeing growing in the world today, Brexit being the most recent case. So, could we develop some new approaches to this problem of inequality? Because the, the only approach today is to redistribute wealth, tax people, and spread it around more. Could we pre-distribute wealth? Could we change the way that wealth gets created in the first place by democratizing wealth creation, engaging more people in the economy, and in ensuring that they got fair compensation? Let me describe five ways that this can be done. Number one: Did you know that 70 percent of the people in the world who have land have a tenuous title to it? So you got a little farm in Honduras. Some dictator comes to power. He says. Uh, I know you got a piece of paper that says you own your farm, but the government computer says my friend owns your farm. This happened on a mass scale in Honduras, and this problem exists everywhere. Hernando de Soto, the great Latin American economist, says this is the number one issue in the world in terms of economic mobility, more important than having a bank account, because if you don't have a valid title to your land, you can't borrow against it, and you can't plan for the future. So today, companies are working with governments to put land titles on a blockchain, and once it's there, this is immutable. You can't hack it. This creates the conditions for prosperity for potentially billions of people. Secondly, a lot of writers talk about Uber and Airbnb and TaskRabbit and Lyft and so on as part of the. Sharing economy is a very powerful idea that peers can come together and create and share wealth. My view is that these companies are not really sharing. In fact, they're successful precisely because they don't share. They aggregate services together and they sell them. What if, rather than Airbnb being a $25 billion corporation, there was a distributed application on a blockchain? We'll call it B Airbnb, and、uh, it was essentially owned by all of the people who have a room to rent. And when someone wants to rent a room, they go onto the blockchain database and. All the criteria、uh, sift through, help them find the right room, and then the blockchain helps with the contracting. It identifies 
the party. It handles the payments, just through digital payments, are built into the system, and it even handles reputation because if she uh, uh, rates a room as a five-star room, that room is there and it's rated and it's immutable. So the big sharing economy disruptors in Silicon Valley could be disrupted, and this would be good for prosperity. Number three. The biggest flow of funds from the developed world to the developing world is not corporate investment, and it's not even foreign aid. It's remittances. This is the global diaspora: people who've left their ancestral lands, and they're giving, sending money back to their families at home. This is $600 billion a year, and it's growing, and these people are getting ripped off. Annalee Domingo is a housekeeper. And she lives in Toronto, and every month she goes to the Western Union office with some cash to send her remittances to her mom in Manila. It costs her around 10 percent. The money takes four to seven days to get there. Her mom never knows when it's going to arrive.、It、takes five hours out of her week to do this. Six months ago, Annalee Domingo used a blockchain application called、um, Abra. And from her mobile device, she said 300 bucks went directly to her mom's mobile device without going through an intermediary. And then her mom looked at her mobile device, and it's kind of like an Uber interface. There's Abra tellers moving around. She clicks on a teller that's a five-star teller who's seven minutes away. The guy shows up at the door, gives her a Filipino peso. She puts them in her wallet. The whole thing took minutes, and it cost her two percent. This is a big opportunity for prosperity. Number four, the most powerful asset of the digital age is data, and data is really a new asset class, maybe bigger than previous asset classes like land under the agrarian economy or an industrial plant or even money. And all of you, we create this data. We create this asset, and we leave this trail of digital crumbs behind us as we go throughout life. And these crumbs are collected into a mirror image of you, the virtual you. And the virtual you may know more about you than you do, because you can't remember what you bought a year ago, or said a year ago, or your exact location a year ago. And the virtual you is not owned by you. That's the big problem. So today, there are companies working to create a identity in a black box, the virtual you owned by you. And this. Black box moves around with you as you travel throughout the world, and it's very, very stingy. It only gives away the shred of information that's required to do something. A lot of transactions, the seller doesn't even need to know who you are; they just need to know that they got paid. And then this avatar is sweeping up all this data and enabling you to monetize it. And this is a wonderful thing because it can also help us protect our privacy. And privacy is the foundation of a free society. Let's get this asset that we create back under our control, where we can own our own identity and manage it responsibly. Finally, <laughs> finally, number five, there are a whole number of creators of content who don't receive fair compensation. Because the system for intellectual property is broken,、It、was broken by the first era of the internet. Take music. Musicians are left with crumbs at the end of the whole food chain. You know, if you were a, a songwriter 25 years ago, you wrote a, a hit song. It got a million singles. You could get royalties of around forty-five thousand dollars. Today, you're a songwriter. You write a hit song. It gets a million screams. You don't get forty-five k. You get thirty-six dollars, enough to buy a nice pizza. So Imogen Heap, the Grammy-winning singer-songwriter, is now putting music on a blockchain ecosystem. She calls it Mycelium, and the music has a smart contract surrounding it. And the music protects her intellectual property rights. You want to listen to the song; it's free, or maybe it's a few microcents flow into a digital account. You want to put the song in your movie; that's different, and the IP rights are all specified. You want to make a ringtone; that's different. She describes that the song becomes a business, 
It's out there on this platform, marketing itself, protecting the rights of the author, and because the song is a payment system in a sense, a bank account, all the money flows back to the artist, and they control the industry rather than these powerful intermediaries. Now this is. This is not just songwriters. It's any creator of content, like art,、um, like、uh, inventions, scientific discoveries, journalists. There are all kinds of people who don't get fair compensation. And with blockchains, they're going to be able to make it rain on the blockchain, and that's a wonderful thing. So, these are five opportunities of, out of a dozen to solve one problem: prosperity. Which is one of countless problems that blockchains are applicable to. Now, technology doesn't create prosperity, of course. People do. But my case to you is that once again, the technology genie has escaped from the bottle, and it was summoned by an unknown person or persons at this uncertain time in human history. And it's giving us another kick at the can. Another opportunity to rewrite the economic power grid and the old order of things, and to solve some of the world's most、uh, difficult problems, if we will it. Thank you. Thank you. Ripple targets the. E-commerce sector implementing XRP to speed up Amazon currency conversions. So this article is related to currencies direct, which we talked a bit about. Had great success with X Rapid, which uses XRP, and、um, they are. Let me just pull the information here. They look at minimizing fees by providing cheaper exchange rates for online retail retailers. Than they receive as a standard from e-marketplaces such as Amazon, and they're talking about currencies direct, which is currently partnered with Ripple. So there's an indirect partnership there, or, or connection, I should say, between Ripple and Amazon. So he tweeted this.、Um, the next, he also tweeted、uh, about a rumor where、uh, he says that、uh, J.P. Morgan and Ripple are in early discussions. Now this wouldn't be wouldn't surprise me, guys, because we know Ripple is out there trying to sign banks. They're signing with Bank of America, Santander Bank. So by all means, they would be talking to J.P. Morgan, of course.、Um, so obviously, you know, it says here that.、Uh, oh wait, let me backtrack here. I'm just trying to. It says like an insider <clears throat>、uh, did mention this information to someone.、Uh, so let me give you guys some details here. We were dropped a note by a Ripple insider that piqued our interest. Not only did Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse announce this week that they are in talks with dozens of banks to offer blockchain capabilities and money transfers, but that more announcements were on the way. You know, an announcement of pending annu-、uh, of pending announcements.、Uh, they seem po- to be popular in crypto, but the info we were passed focused on one of the largest global financial institutions, which. With a storied history and an iconic name, J.P. Morgan. So, guys, remember Brad Garlinghouse on CNBC? I did the video. I showed the clip. He said, "Major, we,、uh, they're going to have a, a few major banks by the end of this year using X Rapid, which leverages XRP, right? We know about that." And he said, "Dozens next year, but this year he mentioned major banks. So, could J.P. Morgan be one of them? Sure. I don't. We don't know for sure who, which bank, but." I don't honestly I, at this point I don't really care because I know w- w- once you have like a s- solid amount of banks using X Rapid, there's going to be a FOMO between the banks because they're going to see these other banks saving money,、um, obviously offering maybe cheaper、uh, fees for transfers and all that good stuff, and、uh, being more profitable. And I can see them coming on board and saying, "Hey, we want to we want to get on this as well." So、um, once again. Look at the source it came from. The president of、uh, SBI, right? So、uh, I'm not、uh, I'm not 100% putting 100% confidence in this, but I would put 90% confidence on this. I would leave that 10% of、uh, error or something that maybe potentially could happen, right? Or, or not happen, I should say. So want to share that with you guys. I think this is、um, definitely a good sign. 
remember this guy moves in different circles. He may know certain things we don't, right? Obviously being partnered with Ripple, obviously being part of a major financial institution in Japan. News moves in those circles, guys, and I think this is a sign, the fact that he's tweeting this stuff out there. I don't think he would want to lose his credibility, so um, keep holding your XRP. Keep holding your XRP. Don't panic. Don't worry what's going on in the market. The next big bull run, we're going to see growth, and I think uh, Ripple would be one of the winners, you know, when the dust settles of regulations and, um, you know, you, when it comes to utility, when we're past the you know, the speculation phase and we move to utility, Ripple will rule the market. Uh, I absolutely believe that because think about it. If you have banks, the biggest institutions on earth, guys, and, and, and money transfer companies using uh, XRapid, which uses XRP, the, the value right away would grow up for uh, XRP because it's going to be used in, you know, we're talking about like the transfer of trillions of dollars um, on a daily, monthly basis. So uh, definitely, uh, worth the wait here to keep holding your XRP. Uh, I believe it will take off. I give you my price prediction. I believe you know hit between ten to fifteen dollars by the end of this year, um, and I eventually I think it can hit a hundred dollars or higher. But what will have to happen? We would have to have adoption by banks going live in production with X Rapid as well as money transfer companies, and we also talked a bit about Ripple looking to insert XRP and X Rapid into ecosystems and marketplaces, which will be another use case that would help drive the value of XRP up. The Internet of Value is about rewiring the global financial infrastructure to dramatically improve the cost, speed, and certainty of how transactions flow. It's amazing to me to how many people really don't realize how much friction there is in payments. We've become habituated to just expecting this is how it works. And I think like so many other industries that have been disrupted by reducing friction, increasing speed, I think we're going to see a dramatic change over the next 10 or even 15 years that are really hard to predict today that are the foundation that will be laid upon that internet of value. XRP is part of the heartbeat of Ripple. It is the foundation of how we think about liquidity management and a core problem that how the financial infrastructure works is around how liquidity is managed. Today, financial institutions are wired with pools of capital. They're called Nostro and Vostro accounts. And these are accounts that are pre-funded between financial institutions. And that's capital sitting dormant and not being used for either working capital or lending or what have you. By using a digital asset, you can enable liquidity in real time. This is transformational to how global financial infrastructure is wired. Every marathon starts with a single step. For us, the first step is getting financial institutions engaged in working with us, getting them to understand how the core technology with X current works, introducing how we can help manage liquidity. There's a lot of friction and cost associated with banks and financial institutions working with other institutions. We can change and accelerate how that works really materially, dramatically. And I think introducing XRP into those flows will take time. But as I said, every marathon starts with a single step. When I zoom out and look at where Ripple sits in the blockchain and crypto ecosystem, we are incredibly fortunate to be the only company with real customers solving real problems. That is at the early stages of that marathon. But there's no doubt that as we, we look at the race that has started, we're the only ones that have crossed that starting line.